I do believe that Greg is right, that when the Lord does something, you should testify. The thing is, it doesn't have to be up here. It can be one-on-one. -on -one. Because before we can connect and share with everyone, sometimes God wants us to connect and share with one person. And eventually it grows to connecting and sharing with a group. But we first have to make that initial, we share with the people that, that we know can receive it, and then we grow and, and, and it builds in us as we, every time we share it. Um, all right. <clears throat> Let me open with prayer again. I'm always opening my heart with prayer. Ah, Father in heaven, I just thank you for your goodness and your mercy. I thank you that you're the grace and you're the strength. That you're the healer. I thank you, Father, that you're the word of life. I thank you that you are powerful. I thank you that you are good. And right now, again, I just turn this time over to you, Holy Spirit. There's nothing I desire more than you and to see you, Father. To see you and to know who you are, to receive your word and to receive you is my prayer. You all know the parable of the sower and the seed. I'm not going to read the parable itself, but this is in Mark chapter 4, starting in verse 13. This is where he now explains to his disciples the meaning of the parable. Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things comes in and chokes the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop 30, 60, or even 100 times what was sown. Okay, I just want you to, to hear, let that settle in for a minute. I want, to, uh, I want to quote Isaiah 55 to you, and as I quote it, I want you to parallel this parable with what the Father is speaking in Isaiah 55. Come, all you who are thirsty. Come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend your money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen. Listen to me and eat what is good. And your soul will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me. Hear me that your soul may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. My faithful love promised to David. See, I've made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not. And nation, nations that do not know you will hasten to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. For he has endowed you with splendor. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Listen to this. Let the wicked forsake his way, that hard path. Let the evil man turn from his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me void, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace and the mountains and the hills will burst into song before you and all the trees of the fields will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the pine tree and instead of the briar, the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown, for an everlasting sign which will not be destroyed. Father, we thank you for your word. 
We thank you for your word. And right here, I just want to open again, Lord, as if we're coming into your sanctuary and your word. Father, I, I, I desire for our eyes to be open. Open our eyes. This is, these are the three scriptures I, I read, every morning, read every morning at the sanctuary, or the labor. It starts off, this is in John 13. It was just before the Passover feast. And Jesus knew that his time had come to leave this world and return to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that God had put all things under his power, that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus said, you don't realize now what I'm doing, but later you'll understand. No, said Simon, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, he replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, A person has had a bath and needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that is why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord. And rightly so, because that's what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Ezekiel 36, starting 24. I will take you from the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle you with clean water and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and cause you to follow my ways and be careful to keep my laws. You will live in the land I gave your forefathers. You will be my people and I will be your God. I will save you from all your uncleanness. I will call for the grain and make it plentiful and will not bring famine upon you. Starting in Hebrews chapter 10. The law is only a shadow of the good things coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year make holy those who draw near to worship. If it could, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshiper would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins because it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice an offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. First he says, Sacrifice an offerings you did not desire. <clears throat> burnt offering, or with sacrifice, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, although the law required them to be made. Then he adds, I have come to do your will, O God. He sets aside the first in order to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made perfect forever through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, every priest stands to perform his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool because by one sacrifice he is made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sin and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. Therefore, brothers, 
since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened up for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sin is left but only fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. If anyone rejected the law of Moses, he died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot and who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said it is mine to avenge. I will repay and again, the Lord will judge his people. It's a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Remember those earlier days when you had received the light, when you stood your ground in a great contest in the face of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insults and persecution. At other times, you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You, joyful, you sympathized with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So don't throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and are saved. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made from what is visible. By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offering. And by faith, he still speaks even though he's dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he didn't experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him. Before he was found, he was commended as a righteous man. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By faith, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. And by faith, Abraham, when God told him to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went even though he didn't know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking ahead to a city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age, and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father, because he considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and as countless as the sands on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. None of them received the things that had been promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they'd been thinking of the one they'd left behind, they would have had an opportunity to return. Instead, they were looking for a better country, a heavenly one, and therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith, when God tested him, Abraham, he offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promise was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead. And figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau and regarded their future. 
by faith. Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when his end was drawing near, spoke of the exodus of Israel from Egypt and gave instructions about his bones. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, after he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with God's people rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt. For he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who was invisible. I'm going to say that again. He persevered because he saw him who was invisible. He persevered because he saw him who was invisible. He persevered because he saw him. He saw him who was invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover. By faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. Who's the firstborn of Israel? You are. You are the firstborn of Israel. You are the firstborn of Israel. By the sprinkling of blood tonight, I believe the Lord is saying, by faith, by faith. Now, I've gone out of the scripture here for a minute, but by faith, you as the firstborn of Israel are not going to be touched by that death, by that destroyer. You shall not have the firstborn of Israel. I'm going to continue. By faith, the children of Israel passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell when the people had marched around them for seven days. And by faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. What more shall I say? I don't have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned. They were sodden too. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins, goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. This world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and in mountains, in caves, in holes in the ground. But all these people were commended for their faith, even though none of them saw what had been promised. And that's because God had planned something better for us so that only together with us will they be made perfect. Luke 19. I read this a couple weeks ago. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was. I'm going to read that again. He wanted to see who Jesus was. But being a short man, and that word short in the Greek means small of stature or maturity. Small maturity, small stature. Being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Lord, look, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house. Because this man too was a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. I want to go back to the sower of the field and I want you to to consider 
the, hard, the, the, the way, the hard way. And I want you to consider the hard rock, the stony ground, and the thorny ground, and then the good soil. Like Zacchaeus, sometimes we can feel small in stature and we are low in our maturity level. Especially when our eyes are on the crowd around us. And we don't know what Jesus looks like. Especially back then, they didn't have TVs, they didn't have posters and pictures of people. He wanted to know who Jesus was, what he looked like. Sometimes the crowd is pressing around us and we can't see the Lord. And by the crowd pressing around, I mean this world. It's up front in our face. He went ahead and climbed a tree. And I believe that tree represents the cross. Because it's in the cross that you really truly see Christ. But it moves from that cross. Once you see him and he sees you, then he speaks to you and he says, I must abide in your house. Salvation has come to you, for you're a son of Abraham. See, he was one who was choked out. He was one, Jesus is that word sent from God, come from heaven, will achieve the purpose that God sent him for, to redeem that which was lost, all who were lost. He came to seek him out and call him. He came to Zacchaeus. Now, I don't know Zacchaeus' history, and it doesn't give us one in the Bible. I, I could tell you some stories that I think might be true, but... <clears throat> what I do know is this. Jesus saw him, and he saw that he was one who wanted to see. That word to see, he wanted to see Jesus. And Jesus loves to reveal himself to those who want to see him. He loves to. And more than that, he says, I'm going to make my home with you. And salvation, that word in the Greek, just like the Hebrew house, it means his family. It's not just like it comes to the building, though it certainly can represent that. It said salvation came to his house. No longer was he choked out by the deceitfulness of wealth and by the crowd pressing in around him. He was no longer one that was never going to mature and have stature to grow and produce fruit. That day he chose to let the Messiah abide in his heart. That one thing he sought, to seek the Lord and to gaze upon his beauty, it came to his home and it rested in him and it rested upon him. Now I have a, a challenge for each of you. Last year at this time, this feast, we started and initiated something called the Inheritance Project. And many of you signed up times on that. And uh, I won't go into the reasons why um, some, of those, uh, th some of those commitments have not been fulfilled or whatever the, the case may be. What I do know is this. That when the word comes, I want you to go to verse 16 of Mark 4 I kept on seeing, <clears throat> I don't know if anybody else is like this, but God speaks to me through time. And what I mean by that is if I continually see a digital time for a period of a week or so, I'll, you know, it usually takes me a while, I guess, and I'll go, why do I keep saying this time? God will say, go to this scripture. Okay, I get it. Sometimes it's a, a different reason, but I kept seeing 416, 416, I, I kept thinking, isn't it 316 God? Instead of checking it out, he said, go to Mark 416. So I went, and this is what it says. Others, like seeds sown on rocky places, hear the word at once and receive it with joy, which, believe it or not, it's the exact same word where it says Zacchaeus received him with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble, now listen, this is the part I want you to hear. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word. When trouble or persecution comes because, and I looked at that word, it means on account of. On account of the word. Because of the word, the troubles and persecution came. So when Jesus comes into your heart, when he gives you that prophetic word, when he gives you that inspiration to go and do something, it says troubles and persecutions on account of that word come. And this says here, these people fell away because of it. I know this is one thing that happened. As we began to press into our inheritance last year, we all recognized the presence of the Lord as our inheritance. There were many words going forth to each of you, both from the Holy Spirit and from those around you, that this is a time to consecrate yourself. I read from, for, uh, from Chronicles 16, where David appointed the Levites. And I explained and expounded upon that. We've talked about consecration and different things. There's nothing more clear, more plain for us today than to understand that each one of you are appointed 
to give thanks to the Lord, to praise His name, to stand and bless Him and to worship Him. And there's a various number of words in the Hebrew that describe how that can be done. But that is appointed each of you because that is a service of the priesthood. It's a service of Levi in this day. It's very plain. It's very clear. There's, there's absolutely no misunderstanding about it in Scripture. What happens, though, when you come and you begin to delight in His presence and you receive the Word with joy, you receive the Spirit with joy, and the next thing you know, you get sick. Your uncle dies. The next thing you know, a cow that was worth a lot of money dies. Somebody offends you in the church. Leadership isn't doing things the right way and they hurt your feelings. The next thing you know, all these troubles come up and before long you take offense. There is an issue with the word moed, which is the appointed time. And as a people, we struggle with being on time. But there is a spiritual significance behind that that we could address another night. <laughs> being faithful and obedient in the little things, and that's where it has to start. But what I'd like to do now that I have brought up some of the issues, the troubles, and the persecutions that arise on account of the Word. I just spoke about the, the fathers of faith. And I quoted that word to you, and I, I hope you heard it. Because faith is powerful. By faith, they're able to see through the crowds, through the offenses, through everything. By faith you can see God and come to Him and know that He will reward you. By faith you can say you're the one thing. That word seek means to frequent in worship. Did you know that? To seek, to frequent in worship. I'll tell you, All of us have our own time that we give to the Lord that's between us and we build our relationship there. But as Levites, you're also consecrated for times and seasons to be in the sanctuary. And some of you may wonder, well, why does anybody else need to know that I'm doing this or I'm doing that? It's because we come together as a people and you're consecrated for a time. Um... Actually, I'll go there. If you want to turn there, you can. This is going to be 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Believe it or not, 2 Corinthians also addresses the parable of the sower of the seeds, but I will not read through the whole chapter. If you want, you can go back and read through that, and you'll see how he addresses all the things that can come and choke us out. Okay. For some reason, when I'm in front of people, my Bible doesn't go in order any longer. I know that Corinthians... 2 Corinthians chapter 4. <clears throat> I've quoted this a bunch in the last year or two. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. With that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak, because we know that the one who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Therefore, do not, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. 
So we fix our eyes on what is seen, not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is un uh, unseen is eternal. I've done this before, I'm going to do it again. How many of you heard that note before I played it? I want you to be quiet and listen in the room just for a minute. Everybody be as quiet as you can and listen. Now those of you that are younger and closer will hear that that projector is creating that pitch. Can you hear it? Some of you probably can't. It is. That, that projector is it's doing a B flat. Now, I can hear it, and there's a lot of you that can. However, I'll bet you most of you did not hear it until I pointed it out, even though it's been going the whole time. You still don't hear it? They say as you get older, the higher registers begin to fade away. <laughs> Either way, this is where we have to learn how to trust other people sometimes. Because that sound is in the room, and I hear it. Sometimes, the Holy Spirit is so present and so powerful, and we miss Him. We miss Him. And He's here, right here. He's right here. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because He has anointed me. Okay, now what I want to do, though, is not draw your attention to that. I want you to draw your attention to the Holy Spirit because He's here. And the reason why I'm doing that, I pointed that out as an example. It's so easy to go through this life and to see the things that are seen and to make our lives based upon the things that are seen. To say, these are the things I care for. These are the things I'll live for because you feel them. You see them. But there's something that's more real. There's someone who's more powerful. He lives within you. The great I am, he's inside. And he's alive. Do you remember that this is actually one of the few philosophical statements and philosophers, whatever you want to call it, that I agree with. It says, I think, therefore, I am. Well, I know what that means. I am. What did Moses come and tell the people when he came to deliver him? He said, who am I going to tell him sent me? I am. Right? I am that I am that I am. I think, there, there, I think, therefore, I am. I am is in us. Any consciousness, any ability to observe, be aware of anything, comes from God. He is awareness. He is that consciousness, the power. He's the intelligence in the life. He's the light. He's so alive and He's so loving and He gives and gives and gives. Sometimes children are more aware of this than they understand. And we as adults learn to shut out God. Either because at one time we were a child and you know that free, protected, loving feeling that you just felt alive and the birds were singing and it was, you're just whistling free. And then something happened to you one day and you became more aware of the world. It's like me, you know, when my dad left, I became more aware of that than I was of God. And in my mind, I interpreted this happened in the world, it's happening in the Spirit. And we all, we all begin to see God through the eyes of this world. But guess what? This world is a liar. Why? Because the God of this age, the Spirit over the kingdom of the air, what does He do? He lies and He deceives. But listen, the enemy came to steal, kill, and destroy. If, if things are being destroyed, killed, you know... This is not the work of God. We don't have to question, God, why are you doing this? That's not Him. He came that we might have life and have it to the full. Fix your eyes on Him. Now, why does God allow these things to happen? That is a different question. You know, Graham Cook says, God allows in His power what He, or God allows in His wisdom what He could prevent with His power. And I've come to understand that doesn't mean that if He allows it, it's His will. It means, this is the stage we're in, Okay. When God initiates and first puts that seed inside of us, inside the egg, so to speak, a new life begins. 
That's his seed. He gives it. It's the word of God. It's the spirit. It's Jesus. However, as that egg, as that embryo matures and grows inside that egg, it comes a point, there comes a point where it must hatch. The life is inside and it's a real life. But here's the deal. So many of us want God to pull the little shell off for us. We don't want to have to break through or break out. But you know what happens if God or if any of us were to break open that shell? That bird would not have the strength to survive. It would not have the ability to, to, to expand its heart and begin to breathe in the right way and have strength and live. We are in a stage where we must break through and God is speaking and encouraging us. But see, it's not that He's not there. We're inside the shell. Some of us are waiting for God to break through the shell. And He's saying, you've got to hatch. You've got to. We are not waiting on Him. He is waiting on us. And it's not easy sometimes. We just want to stay in the comfort of that shell. But I'll tell you what. I know each one of you is breaking out of that shell more and more. And I want to... Come full circle and go back to what Greg said. Testify what God is doing. Testify what God has done in you, that it's His life in you that's breaking out, that's going forth. Why? Because He says the word that goes out of my mouth, and then He says that same word to go out, the word in Hebrew, you will go out with joy. He's saying you're the word now, buddy. I tagged you. You're it. So... My encouragement is this. God loves you. We pointed out the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God who because He was slain purchased us for God. We talked about that and we'll talk more about the meaning and the power of the resurrection life as we go through this weekend. My encouragement is this. You are a son of God now. Born of His imperishable seed the living, enduring Word of God. I encourage you, do whatever it takes. Buy an alarm clock that, that sounds like a thousand cats and put it, put it on the other side of the house so that you have to get up to turn it off. And by the time you get there, you'll be so frantic, you will never be able to get back to sleep. <laughs> whatever it is, it, it's the sacrifice, though, of choosing to see Him. This is a sacrifice. To see God does not come naturally to most of us because we've so naturally chosen not to see Him. It's by faith that He persevered and saw Him who is invisible. By faith we must likewise persevere to see Him who is invisible. But it is possible. You can see Him and He's here. And you make that statement and you make that stand and it's by faith. It's by nothing else than saying, I believe that word. He said He's here that nothing can sep separate me from the presence. Nothing can. It says, if I go to the heavens, you're there. If I go to the depths, you're there. If I go to the far side of the sea, you're there. If I go, it's like, you're there, God. So I might as well, like, accept it. And unlike Romans 1, which says they decided to not deny and suppress that truth, that, that you could understand and acknowledge, recognize, realize that God is, they suppressed that truth, and so God turned them over to depravity so that rather than thanking and glorifying and honoring and seeing God, they just kept looking at creation and the world around them. They're desensitized. All you see is this world, the bills you've got to pay, the things you've got to feed, the things you've got to do, this blah, 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 blah. But God is here. And he's, it's the Mary Martha thing, too. You know, when you choose the good part and the one thing, and I could keep talking about this forever because His presence is what it's all about. My encouragement, seek Him. Make it this one thing, the most important thing in your whole life. The most important thing in your whole life. I could read the Church of Laodicea because I believe that that speaks to the United States. And being in that country, it speaks of us. We think we're well clothed and fed and this, that, and the other. And God's saying you're blind and naked. You're not hot, you're not cold, and I'm going to spew you out of my mouth until you develop that passion. Until you remember who I am, I'm knocking at the door of your hearts. And this would tie right into what we've been speaking from Levitical Writings 148. He's knocking at the door of our hearts. He's saying, open wide your heart. This is the statement of faith. This is how you begin to see God. Thanksgiving. It's the master key. 
When you begin to thank Him in the midst of all things, for all things, this is my will that you give thanks in all things, Paul says. That's the will of God. When you begin to do that, you'll begin to see God because you begin to recognize Him, not discounting and pushing God out of your thoughts, but inviting Him to everyone and inviting every single one of your thoughts to Christ in thanksgiving. And you'll be aligned. Eventually, now this takes time, I have to admit, I'm a hypocrite most of the time, and it, the good thing in my life is it's changing. It's not that I'm not... In other words, it used to be that there were things I did in secret that I would want nothing and no one to know about. Now the things I do in secret are awesome and the things I do in front of people aren't so great. <laughs> okay? But... <clears throat> what I believe since is completely spelled out in Scripture is that as we begin to marinate and pickle ourselves in His presence, we'll begin to taste... I hope they're sweet pickles. It's the Holy Spirit pickle, and He tastes like the Holy Spirit. That's all I know how to say. But when you marinate in His presence, it takes time. Because this is what a lot of us... This is why a lot of us get that resistance and why we take offense. It's because we're pressing in and we feel and taste and see that God's good for a moment, and then something in life just throws up on us. And we go... Is this really real, God? Because this feels a lot more real. And this one thing I seek, I, I'm kind of thinking I'm going to be terrified of this enemy. Like, I know you're saying that you're my strength, but, you know, you know, all we see is that. And so it comes slowly. The more we're pickled in his presence, the more like David, we're playing on our harp alone for years, built up years, built up, or the time alone, build up before him. One day you'll stand before Goliath and it will be just as real in front of all the people as it was when you killed the bear on your own and no one got to see. And that's what God's saying. He's saying, spend that time alone, even though it feels like it's not getting anywhere. Instead, on account of that word, on account of that acting in obedience, it's just things like people are dying, people are getting sick, people are accusing me, people are doing this. And God's saying, it's good. Count it all joy. And it's the truth. Boom. It's the truth. That light is more powerful. That reality, his face, his presence is more powerful than anything else in this world. And I'll end with that. Amen. You are free to go or else you can stay and sing with me. I'm going to sing a couple more songs. Shine, Jesus, shine. And, and uh, yeah, we will, but we'll just do shine, Jesus, shine first.